Last week I did a video on conspiracies. I only picked a few because it was already a 20 minute long video, but I left out a pretty big one that was a major plot point in National Treasure 2. Borglum commissioned to destroy landmarks in sacred Black Hills Mountains. Borglum? Mount Rushmore? He carved Mount Rushmore to erase the map's landmarks in order to protect the city of gold. Mount Rushmore was a cover-up. Huh, who would have thought? Mount Rushmore was a conspiracy to cover up landmarks that led to the lost city of gold by literally blowing up the Black Hills. Okay, maybe not. But let's talk about what this landmark to the American Empire really does stand for. Mount Rushmore was originally going to be sculpted in the Needles, a different area of the Black Hills, and it was going to be a monument to the Louisiana Purchase with people like Lewis and Clark. But it was switched to its current location and to the four presidents who are most credited with massive territorial gains, or preserving the Union, or founding the American Empire. Construction began in 1927 and ended in 1941. Many people already know this, but the sculpture was originally supposed to show everyone down to the waist, but a lack of funding simply ended the project. Its location was also quite controversial as it demolished part of the sacred Black Hills, in somewhat of a final middle finger to the native peoples whose land the American Empire was founded on. So why these four? I'm glad you asked that rhetorical version of me. Let's start with the obvious first one, George Washington. The guy who is on the one dollar bill and the quarter and the first president of the United States. I can't believe I have to explain this. And before you can say, I cannot tell a lie. Washington is elected the first president of the United States. I mean, everyone knows that, right? He was the first president of the United States. This is one of those dumb things that smart people say in order to sound smart. When you're in elementary school, you're taught that he was the first president of the United States. Then you go to college and you take your first intro to American history class and you find out that before the Constitution, we had this thing called the Articles of Confederation, which had a leader named the President. So then you go around and tell everyone how wrong they are about George Washington being the first president. But if you ever actually bothered to finish college, you'd realize what a moron you sound like. The Articles of Confederation established a Congress with equal voting power for each state, much like the Senate today. They appointed a leader to serve a one-year term who was called the President of the Congress. That person had no executive power and wasn't in charge of anything beyond calling the Congress to order and keeping the debate civil, much like the leader of the Senate today who was also called the President. These people were not Presidents of the United States. George Washington was the first and became President in 1789. The War for Independence ended six years earlier when he was just Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. He didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, but he is considered to be one of the Founding Fathers because he was a war hero in the war that helped the US get its first real independent territory and because he was the first president. He was elected unanimously, which I've always found a little suspicious. Not only did he win the Electoral College, but 100% of the popular vote. You mean to tell me not even the person running against him voted for themselves? While I have absolutely no proof of this, this seems like one of those things that's a little too perfect to be true. Like it was washed over by history in order to inspire people. But anyway, funny enough, George Washington didn't meet one of the major requirements to become president. In order to be president, you must be at least 35 years old, be a resident of the United States for at least 14 years, and be a natural born citizen. George Washington was not a natural born citizen because the United States obviously didn't exist when he was born. Because of that obvious weirdness, they had to add a provision to the Constitution stating that anyone residing within the United States at the time of the adoption of the Constitution was automatically naturally born. The first actual natural born citizen to be elected president was Martin Van Buren, the eighth president, in 1837. So what does it mean to be a naturally born citizen? Oh god, you're gonna talk about Obama. Yep. In order to be a natural born citizen, you must be born in one of two conditions. Not both, just one. Be born in the United States or one of its outlying territories, or be born to at least one US citizen parent. So let's get the obvious out of the way. If Obama was born in Kenya, he wasn't. He was born in Hawaii, which was part of the United States when he was born. But still, if, it doesn't matter because his mother was indisputably American. So that alone makes him a natural born citizen. Several other presidential candidates have also had questionable citizenship. 
like John McCain, who was born in the Panama Canal Zone, which I'll get to later, but it's an outlying possession, so that's okay. Or Ted Cruz, who was born in Alberta, Canada. His father was Cuban, but his mother was American. I wonder why people never questioned their citizenships, but they denied Obama's for years. Huh. Weird. Anyway, moving on. Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States and is on the $2 bill and the nickel. Just as a side note, the $2 bill is real currency, but it's not some sort of collector's item. They make new ones almost every year. Jefferson is on the monument because of the Louisiana Purchase, which almost doubled the territory of the United States. Under the French, Louisiana existed solely for the purpose of providing food for Haiti. Haiti was a French territory which grew almost exclusively sugar and nothing else. So food had to be brought in from New Orleans. Haiti went through a slave revolt in the 1790s, and when it became apparent to Napoleon that he was gonna lose control of the territory, Louisiana was of no further value. So he offered to sell it to the US. This caused somewhat of a constitutional crisis in America, however. Jefferson was a believer in a strict interpretation of the constitution, which didn't give the government or the president power to buy land. But it would have been absolutely stupid to refuse this deal. For just $15 million, the price for the 828,000 square miles was too good to pass up. So they said that the acquisition wasn't a purchase, but a treaty, which the government is totally allowed to do. Another major issue of the purchase was what to do with the 60,000 French inhabitants of the land, half of which were freed African slaves. Do we make them citizens? What would that do to American democracy? How can we allow so many non-Americans automatic citizenship? This argument should remind you of a current situation facing a similar issue. But Napoleon insisted that automatic citizenship be part of the treaty, so that was put to bed rather quickly. Mount Rushmore lies in the middle of the Louisiana Territory, and as I said in the beginning, it was meant to be a monument to that purchase. The same year of the purchase, Jefferson commissioned the Corps of Discovery Expedition, more commonly known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition, whose purpose was threefold. Explore and map the new territory, find a practical route to the Pacific Ocean, and establish an American presence in the territory. They established several forts and buried supplies on their way westward, and they reached the Pacific coast of Oregon in November 1805, and then walked all the way back in spring 1806. The entire expedition took 17 months, made 140 maps, established diplomatic relationships with 70 Native American tribes, and discovered over 200 new species of plants and animals. Next is Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, who is also on the $5 bill and the penny. The penny is a coin so worthless that if you melted it down and sold the metals, you'd make a 250% profit. But that's a different story for a different time. Lincoln is on the monument for two reasons, and they're probably probably not the reasons that you're thinking of. Well, okay, one of them is probably right. But first, let's go ahead and talk about your two guesses. Preserving the Union and freeing the slaves. Okay, first of all, he obviously preserved the Union by being the president during the Civil War. While I could probably make a dozen videos about the Civil War really quick, this is another one of those dumb things that smart people say in order to sound smart. At the beginning of the war, if you were a betting man, you would have put your money on the South to win. Yeah, if you're a betting man who hates winning. While yes, at the beginning of the war, the South did have a larger army and home field advantage, the North had a much higher population, a much larger manufacturing industry, and most importantly, much more railroad, which meant that they could mobilize a much larger army much quicker. The war did not start over slavery, per se. Lincoln never ran on the platform of ending slavery, but the South was afraid that they were eventually going to lose their slaves because of Western expansion. According to the Missouri Compromise, states were admitted into the Union in twos, one slave and one free. But the West was running out of states to admit, so they knew the end was near, so they preemptively seceded when Lincoln was elected. In the beginning, the war was simply about ending the rebellion and bringing the South back into the Union. But it became about slavery when the tide started to turn against the South two years into the war. At that point, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which only freed the slaves in any territory in active rebellion against the United States. So in the four loyal slave states and the occupied areas of Tennessee and Louisiana, slavery was still legal until the 13th Amendment was passed. Lincoln was alive when the amendment was proposed Opposed, but died before it passed. So did Lincoln free the slaves? Pretty much, yeah, but not entirely. 
As I discussed in my railroads video, the first transcontinental railroad was supposed to be the southern route, connecting Texas to California. But since Texas joined the south in seceding, Lincoln approved the central route from Omaha to San Francisco. It was completed in 1869, thus joining the west with the rest of the country. Before the railroad, you either had to take a several months long journey through the Oregon or Overland trails, or set sail around the southern tip of South America. So what are the two reasons why Lincoln is on the monument? For bringing the south back into the fold, and for bringing the west into the fold. And finally, Teddy Roosevelt, who actually hated being called Teddy. He's not on any money, but he does have a stuffed animal, I guess? Like Lincoln, Roosevelt is on the monument for two reasons. First of all, like Washington, he was a war hero. He was a colonel of a cavalry unit called the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. This is the war that really cemented the idea of the American Empire. Geez, it took you almost 10 minutes to get to the topic this video is about. The Spanish-American War was when we acquired Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and Cuba. We liberated Cuba in exchange for being able to lease a naval base there. If you can name that naval base, 10 points to Gryffindor, which we still pay rent for, by the way. We also gave the Philippines their independence after several rebellions and occupation by the Japanese during World War II. But before that, it was granted Commonwealth status, which is what Puerto Rico is today. Every year, we're setting a new record for how long the United States has gone without adding a new state. This, right now, is the longest we've ever gone. Now this is. Now that Puerto Rico is obviously next in line, and while there are some people there who want to become a state, it's often blocked by Congress. Why? Because about 100 years ago, Congress locked themselves in at 435 seats. If they didn't, we'd currently have over 10,000 seats. This means if Puerto Rico were to become a state, it would take away seats and electoral votes from a current state. Puerto Rico would get five seats and electoral college votes, all of which would probably be Democrat. So it's kind of easy to see why Puerto Rico is still just the Commonwealth. Not like Guam, which is an unorganized territory like American Samoa, the Northern Marianas Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so many Pacific Islands that it would take me forever to name all of them, and nobody lives there anyway, so no one would be offended if I left them out. But Roosevelt is also on the monument for building the Panama Canal, where John McCain was born. In order to cross the isthmus, ships enter locks which raise the sea level up 85 feet before dropping them back down. Another fun fact, the Atlantic entrance to the canal is more west than the Pacific entrance. In exchange for construction, the United States and Panama jointly controlled the canal until 1999. The Panama Canal Zone, which extends five miles out from either side of the canal, was treated much like a military base overseas. But this is where the idea of American empire really took shape, which is why Roosevelt is the playable character in Civilization VI. Welcome to the United States of America. Now, not only did we control a giant chunk of the continent, but trade across the hemisphere, as well as island territories across the globe, which set us up to become a superpower after the world wars. So the next time someone asks you why those four presidents are on Mount Rush, whoa, wait, what about the Mexican-American War and Hawaii and Alaska? Am I really gonna have to make another one of these? All right, well, at least for now, you know better. Hey guys, I just want to let you know that I'll be live streaming and commenting on the State of the Union Address Tuesday night, much like I did during the third presidential debate. But if you like this video or you learned something, make sure to get that like button to click. If you'd like to see more from me, I put out new videos every weekend, so make sure to imperialize that subscribe button. But in the meantime, if you'd like to watch one of my older videos, how about this one?